You know, I want to pick up on something that my wife, Boomi, said. And uh, she said, sometimes in our faith, we wrestle. Sometimes in our flesh, we wrestle. You know, Paul talks about the war, the spiritual war that goes on within a man, within a woman, you know, in Ephesians chapter 6. And the faith that we all hold on to, the faith that we have, gets tested. Sometimes doubt creeps in. Sometimes life happens without asking us if, if it can happen. We're tempted to pull back. We're tempted to walk away. We're tempted to stop believing, stop trusting. We're tempted to stop serving. We're tempted to stop giving unto the Lord. We're tempted to stop growing in the Lord. Because how many of you know that None of us really ever graduate in our faith. We simply move on, Lord willing. We move on to different levels in deeper faith as we grow. And, you know, on Wednesday nights, we've been going through this awesome study in the book of Hebrews. And if you have uh, your Bibles, please turn with me to to the book of Hebrews. And we're going to pick up on... Chapter 12, and many of you know who were here last week, and then on Sunday, we spent time in Hebrews chapter 11, focusing on this idea of faith by faith, and there's, there's a long list of people in the Bible, or different Biblical characters and persons that exemplified faith. And they manifested their faith in different ways. Some by action, some by obedience. But it all had to do with how we bring together both faith and practice. Everybody say faith. Faith. Say practice. So faith and practice, they go hand in hand. Not one with the other. Without the other. They go hand in hand. Because what is faith if we don't practice it? It's just an idea. Right? And what is practicing, okay? What is practicing good deeds or good works without faith? Right? You're left wanting. People that are good people. Folks that say, I'm not a bad person, we can't earn our way to heaven. The only thing that pleases God is by faith and faith in him and a trust that is placed in God. Now, when I heard my wife talking about this idea of wrestling, it prompted something in my spirit, something that reminded me about what the early church was going through when this book was written. When the book of Hebrews was written in the first century to the early Christians, they were majority Christian Jews, Jewish believers, okay? And many of these believers, as we've studied and learned throughout these last several weeks in the book of Hebrews, is that they were tempted to leave their Christian faith and go back to the old Jewish ways of doing things, back to the sacrificial cult, back to sacrificing animals for their sins. We covered this in depth, and we talked about why the people wanted to go back to what was comfortable to them and the things that they knew, because it was difficult for them to feel that they could completely put their trust in this man named Jesus from Nazareth, who died on the cross and supposedly died for their sins. 
so that their sins would be completely eradicated and so that they could have a relationship with God that was established by the cross at Calvary. So, the people in Hebrews were wrestling with their faith. They were wrestling on whether or not they should stick with it, whether they should stick to it. And sometimes we go through those same kinds of tests, those same, same kinds of trials, that same kind of struggle. Sometimes we go through desert, desert times in our life or in our faith where we feel so dry, we feel so empty, we, we feel so without. It seems like we don't see the hand of God working in our lives. We look to our right or to our left and we can't see Jesus walking with us. But how many of you know that Jesus is there with us? He's there with us through our ups and downs, through thick and thin, whether we re realize that or not. And it comes back to what we talked about earlier. It's not until you've grown and you mature in your faith do you actually get a chance to look back and see God's hand and God's goodness and God's faithfulness. In Hebrews chapter 11, there's a whole cloud of witnesses. Everybody say witnesses. And these witnesses were the people of the faith. They call Hebrews chapter 11 the hall of faith. And I'm going to read three verses from Hebrews chapter 12. And that's about all we're going to have time for tonight. Verse 1 says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you tonight, and we thank you for your word. Lord, we ask that you would teach us your word, that your Holy Spirit would guide us and direct us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, and the people of God said, amen. Hebrews chapter 12 says, therefore... Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I want you to picture a stadium full of people. I want you to picture a stadium full of people. Picture the Coliseum where the Raiders used to play or where USC continues to play. Picture the Rose Bowl. Picture the Rose Bowl full to capacity. From the first row to the top row. I want you to picture yourself there in the middle of the Colosseum, in the middle of the Rose Bowl. I want you to picture yourself there down on the field. And I want you to see the faces of the people of faith that have gone on before you. I want you to picture Moses, Abraham, Noah, you don't even know what they look like. But just picture them. Picture your, your father, your mother in the faith. Friends, family, family members that were in the faith. Picture people that died in the faith. Everybody say died in the faith. Because there's many people who died trusting in the faith. Just like the cloud of witnesses did. Here in chapter 11. So picture yourself there. And then now I want to bring a little bit more imagery into that. I want, to pick, I want you to now picture a, a track. 
a track and field right there in the middle of that Coliseum. And you're the one that's in the race. And you got a whole bunch of other people that are lined up with you, alongside you, right there in that race. Now I want you to know something. I want you to know that all those spectators, all those people that are there in that Coliseum, they're at the Rose Bowl. They're seated in all throughout that huge arena. They're there to root you on. They're there to see you run your race from start to finish. That's why in sports they have this thing called home field advantage or home court advantage. It's where your fans, the fans for the Golden State Warriors, for the Clippers, whenever they play at home, you look into the stands and you see nothing but blue and red. And those are all the Clippers fans. That's why they have home court advantage. It's so that as they're playing the game, they have an advantage. Everybody say advantage. They have an advantage and that they're placed in the best possible position to win. They're placed in the best scenario to have the support of all of these fans that are there to cheer them on, that have paid good money to come out and watch them play, to scream and shout and cheer and encourage them, knowing that there's opposition, knowing that there, there's an opponent, knowing that there's somebody on the other team that's coming into your own house trying to defeat you. Now I want you to take that scenario and I want you to place it within a spiritual context. And this spiritual context is one where you see yourself running the spiritual race, running a race with the cloud of witnesses that have gone on before us that are rooting for you to have victory in your life. Because God is on your side. Jesus is on your side. Jesus is on my side. And he wants to see us win. God wants to see us win in life. God wants to see us win in our faith. When you see yourself there and you're reminded of all those difficult moments in your lives, maybe things are all going great for you right now, but remember, hold on to something from tonight that when you do get to that moment or that place in your life, you're going to have to remember that there are people that are rooting for you to win, to make it. To finish the race. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything. This idea of throwing off, it's a little bit more grand. Throwing off is a little bit, I think, more of a, an exaggeration than actually what it says in Greek. In Greek, it says more like, let us take off or lay aside. Let us put aside. Let us put aside. It says, let us put aside everything that hinders. Now, This word for hinder in Greek means this. Successfully getting in your way. Successfully getting in your way. Let us lay aside anything that is successfully getting in your way. And it actually means actually standing in your way. If I broke it down in Greek, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to all of us, so I'm not even going to try to say the word. It means successfully standing in your way. Has anybody ever gotten into your way, and every time you try to move, they move with you, and you couldn't pass? 
successfully standing in your way. Let us lay aside, let us put aside anything that is successfully standing in your way. Now, if somebody is standing in your way, if something is getting in your way, if something is impeding your progress, if there's an obstacle in your life, and guess what? You either have to remove the obstacle or you have to go around the obstacle. But if you know that when you're ever, whenever you're running a race, you can't, you can't swerve or get out of your lane. You have to stay in the pathway that the Lord has marked out for you. So if we have different, we all lead different lives. How many of you would agree that we all li live different lives? There may be a little overlap. There may be some consistencies. There may be some things that we've all shared or experiences that we've gone through that we can identify or, or, or sympathize with, with one another. But by and large, we all have different lives and we all have different paths. And so that's why when we face those obstacles, those challenges, those successful things that are getting in our way, that are preventing us from having progress, then those are moments in our lives when only you know and only you can identify what they are. And only you can identify them by the power of the Holy Spirit in order that you might remove them from your path. Now, I loved hearing these women share their testimonies about the things that the Lord was successfully allowing them to remove from their pathways. And there is liberty in the Spirit. There is liberty in the faith. There is liberty when we are finally allowed when we finally identify the things that are hindering us, and let me go to another step further in verse 1, or the sin, the sin, the sin that so easily entangles. So there's things that are causing roadblocks, and then there's sin that's also getting in our way and tripping us up. Let's talk about sin. What are some of the things or ways that sin affects us? Sin can drive us away from God. Sin can cause distance from you and God. Sin can cause distance between you and others. When you know that there's sin in your life, when, when I know that there's sin in my life, it causes me to put distance between me and somebody else because I'm no longer allowing Jesus to be the person in between me and that other. You follow me? Because instead of light or truth, I'm allowing lies. I'm allowing things to affect me and, 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 and allowing circumstance or situation to be the thing that I see in that person. And so that's how relationships are torn down, because we allowed sin to impact us in our lives. Sometimes sin eats us up from within. Sin starts to do, stu do stuff inside of us, internally. You know when you're struggling with something internally? It messes with your mind. We start, we st we start losing confidence in Christ. We start, we start losing confidence in who we are as a person, as an individual. Sin does a whole bunch of different things. Do you want to know why sin causes distance between us and God? Because God is so holy. God is so holy. When we allow things to weigh us down, when we allow sin to bog us down, we're allowing it to affect the communication that we have with God. Sin wants to come in, creep in, start affecting us individually, then starts to affect your relationships with the closest people to you. It may be your spouse. It may be your children. It may be your, your parents. It may be your brothers or your sisters. Sin does that. But have you ever trusted God? Have you ever even given things over to God and said, God, here, take this. Here, God, let me lay this aside. Let me get rid of this. It's weighing me down. I'm trying to run this race that, that you've marked out for me, but I'm allowing these other things to grab hold of me. It's like trying to run a race with the piano on your back. It's like wearing too many clothes, too many layers of clothing, and you're trying to run a race. 
Now, if any of you pay attention in the Olympics, and if you ever watch track and field athletes, guess what? They're out there wearing the most aerodynamic clothing outfits that you can possibly imagine. Because they want to have nothing that will cause resistance for themselves when they're running into the wind. They want to be lean. They want to be mean. They want to be as efficient as possible. Their, their, their spikes, track spikes, are so light. Their clothing fits so tight on their body. You could see, you could see the chiseled muscles in their abs when you see these track athletes run. And they're in the most amazing shape. They're world-class athletes. And they know they cannot afford to allow anything to create drag. You know what drag is, right? Slow you down. You ever got into a car crash and your bumper's jacked up? It causes drag. It's catching all that air and it's pulling your car to the right. Some of you laughing because your bumper looks like that right now. Praise God. Wait till next month's check. But be encouraged. Don't be discouraged. That's why the Lord has brought you here to be a part of this fellowship, to be a part of this assembly, this body right here. Now, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what your past looks like, the Lord wants to systematically come alongside you and help you begin to shed layer after layer after layer after layer so that you can be the best possible you that God wants you to be. The most efficient in the best spiritual shape possible. And that's what, that's what these retreats are meant to do. These retreats are meant to not only go and say, okay, what do I got to do to get spiritually fit? Some sisters are going there saying, okay, I'm coming to, become, to get spiritually fit, and I know there's some things that I need to do. I know, I know there's some, some areas of my life that I'm going to have to prune. I know there's some areas of my life that, that I'm going to have to have self-discipline or self-control so that I can regain control and allow the Lord to do a greater work in my life. And that's what we're talking about right here. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside everything that successfully stands in our way and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with, everybody say, hupomone. Hupomone means it's perseverance or patience, long-suffering. Hupomone is what um, allows you to be steadfast. Steadfast. It means you're unwavering in your faith or in your pursuit. Have you ever seen somebody when they're on a mission and nothing can get in their way? You know, that's one of the greatest things. When you see somebody who's self-motivated, when you see people who are driven, like my son, my son Elisha, he's so driven when it comes to sports and, and athletics. He's such a competitor when it, when it comes to winning. Yesterday, we're throwing the ball in the backyard, and we turned it into a little pitching game. Pretty soon, he was losing the pitching game, and he got so emotional because he was, he was in a pursuit. He was in pursuit of trying to attain something. He wanted to grab hold of victory. That's how my boy is. Judah, when it comes to bugs and nature, he's whatever he has to do in order to attain that goal, that bug, them crickets that he let out in my garage, all 40 of them. <laughs> whatever he's got to do to attain those crickets, he's going to do because he's fixed. His eyes are fixed. Look what it says. And let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us. Not somebody else's race. In sports, you're going to hear this language. Just do your thing. Be you. Run your own race. Run your race. Don't run someone else's race. Play your game. Play your game. Mayweather, he, 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 he did his thing. 
Everybody wanted Mayweather to knock out Pacquiao. He, he, he did his thing. He didn't veer from the game plan. He stayed within his game plan, and it was a successful game plan. So we each have a different race. Some of us are single-parent mothers. That's your race. Some of us are not married. That's your race. Some of us are married. That's your race. You guys tracking with me? We all have a different race. Don't try to run somebody else's race. And, you know, another thing they, they say about runners, especially sprinters, don't look back. You fix your eyes on what's ahead of you. You fix your eyes on the tape. Right, Katrina? You fix your eyes on the tape because that's your goal. That's your end game right there. You fix your eyes on that. You can't worry about what this person is doing or what that person is doing. You start looking at somebody that's getting ahead of you, and guess what? You try to start acting like them, try to start doing stuff like them, and all of a sudden you go pull up a hamstring. When you try to be somebody else that you're not in your, in your faith or in life, that's when you start becoming somebody that you're not. But no, be who you are. Right there where you are. Loving your children where they're at. Figuring out life right there where you're at. What is your race? And how does God want you to run it? What is your spiritual race? And how does God want you to run your spiritual race? Maybe you're not employed right now. That's part of that specific leg of your race. Because races are oftentimes broken up, broken down by, by meters. 100, first 100 meters, second 100 meters, third 100 meters, and the last, 400, uh, the last 100 meters that makes up one lap around. Oftentimes races are broken up into legs, they call them. You may be going through an unemployed leg of your race. How will you run that race? How will you run that aspect of your race? Will you fail God? Will you fail yourself? Will you fail others? Will you start getting down on yourself? No, guess what? Sometimes things are with, beyond your control. But how will you run your race? How will you allow God to guide you? Is this making sense? The author to the Hebrews is saying, and don't leave the track. He's trying to convince the early Christian Jews not to leave the faith. Don't run off the track. Just because you may feel like you're falling behind in the race or you're, you're coming around a turn and it's unfamiliar. Stay the course. Stay the course. Keep your eyes fixed. Fixed on who? Look what it says in verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the beginner. And the finisher of our faith. He's the one who started this race for us. And he's the one who's going to help us finish. Jesus. Jesus is going to bring us from start to finish. Because when we give our life to Jesus, it's only the beginning. When we commit our life to the Lord, it's only the beginning of our race that we set out with him. Running alongside him. Running at your own pace. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher. In some versions, the NIV calls it the perfecter. And it simply is talking about the completion. Because when you're made perfect, you're made whole, you're made complete. And that's a finished work. None of us are perfect now. Don't try to be perfect. We will not be perfected until the day that we stand before our God. Until the day we stand before our creator. That's the day that we will be made perfect through Jesus. And he says, yes, I know her. Yes, I know him. Jesus makes us perfect. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Jesus didn't go to the cross laughing. That's not what it means. <laughs> Let's get that straight. Jesus didn't go, ha, 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 there's the cross. It's not the kind of joy it's talking about right here. Watch this, ladies. You're going to understand this. A whole lot better than us guys. You ready for this? The kind of joy that it's talking about right here when it says Jesus for the joy and who for the joy set before him endured the cross is talking about this. The kind of joy that a mother has when she knows she's about to give birth to her child. 
It's going to be painful. It's going to be ugly. Most of you guys are going to faint like I almost did. But when it's all said and done, there's a joy. Oh, my Lord. Thank you, Lord. They forget about everything. They forget all the pain. They forget about all the suffering. They forget about everything that it took, all the anxiety. Are you guys following me? That's the kind of joy that it's talking about here that Jesus experienced, knowing that he had to head to the cross. He didn't want to go to the cross. He didn't want to. Some of you ladies, you don't want to go and have to give birth to a baby. One way or another, it's got to happen. It's got to be done. And you're like, and I'm the one that's got to do it. Because us brothers, we're just simply not fit for that. Praise the Lord. There's just some things that you ladies can do that we can't. <laughs> and thank God. So that's the kind of joy that it's talking about right here, that Jesus knew the end game. Jesus knew that what would take place after the cross would be the salvation of the world. Isn't that a blessing? That, that he would remove sin if we put our trust in him. He would remove sin from our lives and that God would see us through the eyes of his son, Jesus. So as we fix our eyes on the Lord, let's remember what it says here in verse 3. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. Consider Jesus, he sa it says, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It says when you're going through those difficult times, remember Jesus. He knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to be rejected. He's no he knows what it's like to be lied on. He knows what it's like to have rumors started about you. He knows what it's like for them to talk bad about you on Facebook, like they're talking bad about me this past week. They, they, they're, they're just talking bad because my baseball team is good. And there, somebody was talking crap, and I heard wind by, oh, man, poor guy. He must not have a life. Because I love those kids to death. Guarantee if his son was on my team, man, he'd be pumped. And then I'd be the best coach in the world somehow. And when somebody told me that somebody was talking about me, I said, praise God. I must be doing something right out there on the field. I said, but if I run him into the park, guess what? If I run into that guy on the park, I'm going to give him a big hug. What's up, bro? Man, give me a big hug, man. How you doing, bro? Remember basketball season? That was great when your son was on our team. Now you're saying this about us. I'm just praying for the brother. But what it's saying is remember that Jesus has gone through all the things that we've gone through. And one last thing, he's your biggest fan. He'll, he'll travel on the road with you. When the Clippers got to go to Houston, those faithful fans are going to be there. The crazy Clipper fans are going to be there at the Houston Rockets Stadium in the arena trying to buy expensive tickets. But guess what? Jesus, he'll go with you wherever you go. He'll travel with you on the road. He, you can look up right there at the top of the arena. He may have the, the worst seat the, in the nosebleeds. Jesus may be sitting up in the nosebleeds. But guess what? You're going to see him up there. He's going to be like, I got my eye on you. I'm your biggest fan. Jesus is cheering you on. He's pulling you down, back. He's pulling you down the back stretch. Don't lose hope. Don't give in. Never quit. Keep your eyes focused on the prize, which is Jesus Christ. Trust the Lord that he's going to help you grow in your faith. And never look back. Church, he wants you to never look back. He wants you to stay focused on running your race. Don't run anybody else's race. Stay focused on running your own race. Don't compare yourself to anybody in life. Be who you are. Be who you are. Be who you are. Be who God made you to be. You're unique. You're the only one with your own DNA. There's nobody else like you in the world there was nobody that was ever made like you. There will never, ever be another you. And that's how much God loves you.
that he's given you the beauty of being able to work this thing out and to make life whatever you will allow it to be.